Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Of all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, he had to walk into mine. Okay, it's not really my gin joint, but I did stop in after work from time to time. It was called Plato's Place. It was my refuge and I'd gotten to know Tony, the bartender, pretty well. I sure as hell didn't need him hanging around. His name was Eugene Whistler. I used to go to school with him. I've seen him around occasionally since then and said hi a couple times, but he's no one I ever wanted to hang around with, that's for sure. I guess he's a nice enough guy. He's just such a naive. All through school guys used to taunt and bully him because they knew he'd never stand up for himself. Once, when we were high school freshmen, I saw him getting pushed around by three upperclassmen. I always hated bullies, so like an idiot, I intervened. I charged right in the middle of it all and was hoping he'd at least have my back. Silly me. He took off running like a scared rabbit. By the time he got back with the teacher, I was laying on the ground with a bloody nose, a fat lip, and two black eyes. Now here he was sitting at my favorite bar. I was thinking about turning around and just walking out, but Tony saw me and already had my beer sitting on the counter, right next to Eugene. Ugh. Oh well. My mother taught me to always be polite. Hi, Eugene. What's going on? was my polite opening line as I took my seat. He turned his head to see who was talking to him. It looked as though he'd been crying. Chase, hi. I, I just stopped in for a beer, that's all. What are you doing here? Same thing. Thought I'd have a cold one before going home. I really didn't want to tell him I was in there quite frequently. My next question popped out before my brain caught up with my runaway mouth. You look a little down. Everything okay? He didn't answer right away, just kept looking into his beer glass. I was hoping he didn't hear me but no such luck. My, my wife is cheating on me and don't know what to do about it, he sniffled. Well, divorce comes to mind real quick there, partner. You know for sure, or just have your suspicions. Oh no, there's no doubt. She's with him right now. They kicked me out of the house so they could be alone. I almost choked on my beer. You're kidding, right? I said with a small chuckle. I looked at him, waiting for the punchline, but he just kept staring into that glass. They kicked you out of the house, your house? Shamefully, he nodded his head. Yup, same old Eugene. He obviously hadn't learned a thing since high school. Damn, he was just so aggravating. I wondered how anyone could let something like that happen. This guy needs help, I told myself, but not from me. I wasn't going to get involved this time, not this time. So, you're down here crying in your beer while your wife and some a-hole lover boy are screwing in your house, in your bed? Eugene. Well, what can I do? He interrupted, knowing what I was about to say. I just shook my head in disbelief. Not only hadn't he learned anything, he was worse. What do you want to do? I asked. I want to go down there and kick him both out of the house, but you know I'm no fighter. Chase. Hell, my wife would laugh her head off while he kicked my bum, and besides that, I work for Lisa's dad. One word from her, and I'll get fired. Then I'd have no wife and no job. Yeah, but you'd have something else that's a lot more valuable. I told him. He looked at me with a question mark on his face. What? Self-respect, I said. I was getting so frustrated with this shit wipe I was finding it hard to contain my anger. You do know what that is, don't you? It's when you walk with your head held high. It's when you feel good about yourself. Do you feel good about yourself, now? He shook his head. Not really. Well, what's more important? Keeping a 304 wife who doesn't love or respect you. A job that you can't keep without throwing away your own self-esteem, or being able to walk down the street looking people in the eye? I thought sure my little raw, raw speech would make him get off his duff and go charging home, but he just sat there. Yeah, it's easy for you. People have always looked up to you. You've never been afraid of anybody, but I'm not like you, Chase. I'm not brave like you. I admit it. I'm a coward, have been all my life. Hell, I've never even been in a fight because I've always run away. I don't imagine there's much likelihood of me all of a sudden becoming brave at this stage of the game. By now my blood pressure had just about reached the boiling point. What a whiny little witch. I stood up, pulled a 20 from my wallet, and threw it on the bar. For both of us, I yelled to Tony. He just nodded and continued talking to some cute blonde at the other end. Come on, I almost yelled as I grabbed Numbnuts by the back of his collar and yanked him off the bar stool. Wait, wait, where are we going? I had him halfway out the door already. To your house. You and I are going to kick some bum, I growled. Oh, Chase, I don't think. Shut up, Eugene. Just get in the damn car and show me where you live. He was so scared during the drive, I was afraid he was going to pee himself while sitting on my leather seats. 
Once we got to his place, he reluctantly led the way inside. Where's the bedroom? I asked. Ah, up ah, up the stairs, down the hall to your left. But, come on. I snarled as I grabbed him by the shirt and pulled him along. As we got to the top of the landing, I looked down the hall. They didn't even have the decency to close the door. Still holding Eugene by his shirt, I marched into the bedroom. They were so engrossed they didn't see us until we were right on top of them. Eugene's wife started to scream just as I snarled my fingers into lover boy's golden locks and dragged him from the confines of her worn-out box and off the bed. He surprised me a little by twisting around as much as he could and throwing a right cross at my head. The problem was I had a good hold of him, and he couldn't turn enough, so his punch landed on the back of my shoulder. I wasn't about to let him get in a second shot. With Eugene's 304 still screaming her head off, I twisted him around and gave Romeo a solid blow in the solar plexus. That took the fight out of him real quick. Pressing my advantage, I swung him around and smashed his face into the wall then gave him a hard punch in the kidney. He just slumped down and sat on the floor after that. I had seen his pants lying next to the bed, so I went over and grabbed his wallet. I pulled out his license and held on to it. I also noticed his phone sticking halfway out of his pocket. Eugene! Eugene! screamed his half-hysterical wife. Who is this man? Get him out of my house, now. Eugene just stood there like he was in a fog. Eugene, shut up, or I'll turn you over my knee and spank the hell out of you. I hollered back to her. That shut her up at least long enough for me to scroll through Dipshit's phone and find his wife's number. Hello, honey. This is a pleasant surprise. Mrs. Cutter, this is going to be surprise, but I'm afraid not a very pleasant one. Who, who is this? Why do you have my husband's phone? Is he okay? Has something happened? I looked over at the a-hole who was still barely moving. Well, to answer your questions, I'm a friend of the man whose wife your husband has been banging. I have his phone because I took it out of the pocket of his pants which are lying on the floor of my friend's bedroom. He's okay for now, but you should keep him on a shorter leash because if I catch him sniffing around my friend's wife again I'll send him back to you in pieces. I hung up before she could say anything in response. I found the camera function on the phone and took a picture of Eugene's wife before she could duck her head under the sheet. I took another one of her paramour who was just starting to get his wits about him again, then texted both pictures to Mrs. Cutter. Shit for brains looked up and saw me with his phone. I think he just realized who I was talking to. What? What did you do? I just texted a picture of you two to your wife, I answered. No, no, you can't. Please. I have kids. Too late now. It's already done. You should have thought of them before threatening and kicking a man out of his own home so you could screw his wife, I spewed. Here, I said throwing his pants at him. Get dressed and get the hell out of Eugene's house. He looked at Lisa who was still cowering under the sheet. I guess he thought she was still in charge of things. Now, I hollered, and if Eugene here ever sees you around his wife again, I won't be so pleasant next time. While he was quickly pulling his pants on, I took out my own cell phone and shot a picture of his driver's license then stuck it back into his wallet and threw it back to him. Here you go, Mr. Arnold Cutter of 320, Landon Drive remember what I said about coming around here again. He wasted no time in extricating himself from the scene. I looked at Eugene who was still standing next to his bed looking as if he'd seen a ghost. Okay, Eugene, the rest is up to you. What? Me. Of course, I can't do everything for you. You married her. You deal with her. I said. That's it, screeched the shrew. I'm calling the police. And tell them what? That your husband came home with a friend and found you in bed with another man? Go ahead. Maybe the local paper will pick it up and print it in their police blotter. I can see the headline now. Daughter of grocery store owner found an adulterous love nest. Yeah, I recognized her as soon as I saw her. Lisa Schultz, at least that was her maiden name. She was a year behind us in school. I was finding it hard to believe that she was married to Eugene. Her dad owned two grocery stores in the area and she used to parade around like she had been decreed. Queen Lisa. Fine, she replied in a huff. Will you at least leave the room so I can get dressed? Eugene, you go with him. I looked at her coward husband and saw his shoulders start to sag. I think he was so used to following orders he didn't even realize he was doing it anymore. Eugene, this is your house, your bedroom, and your wife. I'm going downstairs, but if I were you, I'd stop taking orders and start giving some. With that, I turned and went back downstairs. I could hear her screaming at him, so I thought I'd grab a beer from the fridge and wait to see who emerged victoriously. Of course there was really no question, but I'd stick around anyway in case he needed a ride to the hospital. I had no doubt she could take him. I sat at the kitchen table and listened. 
Mostly all I heard was Lisa, but every once in a while I'd hear Eugene raise his voice. I wondered how many times in his marriage he'd done that. I was almost done with my beer when things seemed to be quieting down. I kind of expected her to come down the stairs dragging his body behind her, but when she appeared from around the staircase she was alone. She glanced around until she spotted me then headed in my direction. If looks could kill, not even a defibrillator could have saved me. I figured Eugene was probably dead on the floor above me and now she was coming for me. I sure hoped I could take her. What did you say to him? She growled. Not much. Just that if he ever wanted to walk with his head held high. She cut right in. Oh, that'll be the day, she scoffed. I continued. I told him that if he ever wanted to walk with his head held high, he'd have to dump your cheating prick. I sneered back. Well, thanks to you, he's up there packing. I hope you're satisfied. I looked at her with what I hoped was a smug expression. Yeah, I'm pretty satisfied. You think you're so smart, don't you? Well, I guarantee you, he won't be gone long. I give him three days at the most. Then he'll come crawling back on his hands and knees, and when he does, I'm going to make his life a living hell. And he'll have you to thank for it. I just maintained the self-assured grin I had on my face, but in my mind I wondered if she was right. I'm sure she knew him better than I did. Suddenly, I wasn't so self-assured. About that time Eugene came downstairs with a suitcase. I saw him through the doorway, but Lisa had her back to him. Ready to go? I called out. Lisa turned around. Eugene Whistler, if you walk out that door, don't count on coming back. For a second, I thought he was going to cave, but then he answered me. I'm ready, Chase. Let's go. I stood and left the kitchen, heading for the front door. We were about halfway outside when we heard her last volley. I mean it, Eugene. Don't bother coming back. I looked over at him. He was scared shitless. I could see it in his face. Now what? He asked. As I heard his question, I remembered Lisa's words about him crawling back. It occurred to me that I may have just ruined this poor guy's life. As shitty as it was, I had no doubt she could make it even worse. Suddenly, I wasn't so sure I was doing the right thing. We drove back to Plato's and I dropped him off by his car. He, or I guess I should say we had decided he'd stay in a motel for the night. I told him to meet me back there at 7 the following evening. The first beer was on me. I had a tough time getting to sleep that night. I kept wondering if I was doing the right thing and cursing myself for getting involved in the first place. Never again, I vowed. The next day, I walked into Plato's around 6, my usual time. Tony popped the top off of a Miller's and set it on the bar in front of me. How's your friend from yesterday? He seemed a little down in the dumps. I had just taken a sip from my long neck. Problems with the wife, I said. I wasn't going to go into any more detail than that. If Eugene wanted everyone to know his business, he could tell them. I did want to ask Tony's advice, though. You ever get yourself mixed up in someone else's marital problems, Tony? He looked at me like I was dumb. I'm a bartender. It's my job, he answered with a laugh. No. I mean, really. Last night, I was instrumental in him leaving his wife. She was treating him like crap. So at the time, I thought I was doing him a favor, but now I'm not so sure. What's got you second-guessing yourself? I thought for a second. I don't know. I mean, what right did I have she's not my wife? Thank God, I joked. I guess it was her confidence. She was so sure he'd go crawling back to her. If he does, she promised to make his life even more miserable than it was before. I probably shouldn't have gotten involved in the first place. For all I know, he's on his knees graveling at her feet as we speak. Well, I can tell you unequivocally he's not on his knees, at least not right now. Oh, I chuckled. And how can you be so sure? Bartender's intuition. Besides, he just walked in, he said with a smile. I turned around and sure enough, he was early, and he was grinning. Hi, Chase. Hi, Tony. Beer is on me, he said, never losing the grin. Okay, I'll bite. Why so happy? Chase, I feel liberated. I really do. Do you think you could teach me how to fight? Fight? What brought all this on? Who do you want to fight? Nobody. I mean not right now anyway. I, I just want to learn how to defend myself, just in case, you know. It should have been me throwing that guy out of my house yesterday, not you. It should have been me. Next time. I didn't like the sound of that. Next time? You thinking about going back to Lisa? He looked at me and for the first time since I'd known him, instead of fear, I saw anger in his eyes. Are you kidding me? The way she treated me? No way. Never. He said emphatically. I got a sense of relief. Maybe there was more to Eugene than I thought. Maybe you just needed a kick in the bum. He continued. No. I'm just tired of backing down all the time. I, I stood my ground today, and it felt good. I want to keep doing it. Stood your ground? What did you do? Tell her off. 
Lisa? No, I haven't even talked to her. No, I stood up to her dad for the first time. He was so shocked he forgot to fire me, he joked. Really? Actually, it was better than that. He's not going to fire me. He stopped by the State Street store this afternoon. That's the one I work at. When he called me into his office, I figured that was it. Anyway, at first he said he'd talk to Lisa and she told him I walked out on her. He told me she was really pissed and if I knew what was good for me, I'd better go straight home after work. I felt like a little boy getting scolded for something and was just about to say, Yes, sir. But instead I thought, what would Chase say? He turned his head and looked straight at me with a big smile. Chase, I said sorry sir, that's not going to happen. She continually cheated on me and I've had enough. He got so flustered I thought he was going to swallow his cigar. God, Chase, I can't tell you how good that felt. For the first time in my life I faced up to somebody, and not just anybody, my father-in-law. Next to you he's the most intimidating guy I know. That gave me a chuckle. I never thought of myself as intimidating. Good for you, I said. Yeah, anyway, when I asked him if I was fired, he said no. He said he never mixed in the private lives of his employees. Chase, I think he actually respected me. Before I left his office, he looked at me, smiled and nodded his head like he was giving me his approval. Well, fantastic, Eugene. See, it feels good to earn a little respect, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure does. Now what about it? Will you teach me to fight? Eugene, I don't think I'm the one you want to teach you. Hell. I probably lost more than I ever won. There are all kinds of places that teach that stuff. There are martial arts schools, self-defense courses, even gyms where you can go and learn to box. If you want to learn to fight, you should go to a professional. Yeah, maybe you're right, he said. We talked for about another hour before he called Tony over so he could pay for the beers, then left. Still think you did wrong? Tony asked. You heard him, huh? I caught bits and pieces of the conversation. He's walking on cloud nine right now. Yeah, who knows, he might even turn out to be an okay guy. I glanced at my watch. Geez, I gotta get out of here myself. I have a date with Mel tonight. Ah, Mel short for Melanie, the love of my life. Well, figuratively speaking, of course. We've been going out for the last six months, which to date, was the longest lasting relationship I'd ever had. She wasn't the most gorgeous girl in town, but she had a petite, little body that drove me nuts. She also had a great sense of humor something I'd found lacking in a lot of women. In addition to all that she was smart and really seemed to like me. I liked her too, but to tell the truth, the word love just never seemed to fit into my dating vocabulary. I'm not sure if I'm just not capable or if it's that the right girl has yet to come along, but so far I've never truthfully told any girl that I loved her. Mel's about as close as I've ever come, who knows, maybe in time. I said so long to Tony and lit out for home. I grabbed a quick shower, changed clothes, and was knocking on Mel's door with two minutes to spare. We were supposed to go out for dinner then to a movie, after which we'd wind up either back here or at my place for some nookie. When the door opened my chin nearly hit the floor. She was dressed in red. That in itself was not surprising. Red was a good color for her. She always looked good in it. It was what she was wearing. Standing in front of me was a vision in scarlet. The red satin corset tightly hugged ever curve of her killer body. It accentuated her hourglass figure and pushed those oh-so-lovely mounds of delectable flesh up so they billowed out over the top. On the bottom of the corset were four garters attached to red, silky smoot nylons and in between was the smallest little red triangle of material that just barely covered the honeyed smooth slit of her box. Topping it all off was a pair of red, for inch heels. You know what they say about not being able to think when all the blood is reassigned from the big head to the little? Yeah, well... I have no idea how long I stood there with my mouth hanging open, but I vaguely remember following her inside and feeling her dainty fingers undoing the buttons of my shirt, then my belt buckle. Why, Chase, I do believe you're happy to see me. In that moment, I gathered all the suaveness I could and replied, Aha. Uh -huh. Come on, said Mel, guiding me toward the bedroom. Let's finish this in comfort. After a short time and a few kisses, I propped myself up on my hands and hovered over her, looking into those gorgeous blue eyes. I knew I couldn't hold out forever, but I was determined to bring her with me. We have wild and amazing sex. I didn't see Eugene again until later the following week. Tony gave me a heads up as he walked in behind me. Hi, Chase. Well, it had been a full week since he'd walked away from the shrew, and he was still smiling. How's it going, Eugene? Still living life as a bachelor, or did she reel you back in again? I was half expecting him to tell me they'd made up, but he surprised me again. I told you, Chase. 
I'm never going back. I filed for divorce three days ago. I'm pretty sure they served her today. She's been calling my cell every five minutes since 11 o'clock this morning. I thought sure she'd come down to the store and make a scene, but she didn't. Really? You're really serious, aren't you? You're actually going to divorce her? Yeah. It might take a while. My attorney said she could drag it out for a year if she wants to. Hopefully she'll just be glad to get rid of me and sign the papers. How did you two ever get together, anyway? She was always strutting around like Little Miss High and Mighty. No offense, Eugene, but you're not exactly what I'd call a catch. I, I don't really know, to tell you the truth, he said, after thinking for a few seconds. I was working in the store during the summer and after school in my senior year. She used to come in and see me all the time. She was nice in the beginning, probably the only girl who ever was nice to me. Now, thinking back, she most likely just wanted someone she could boss around and I fit the bill. I'll say, I mumbled under my breath. So, when did she start bringing guys to the house or did she always do that? No, last week was only the second time she did that. I think she's always been cheating on me, though. She never let me touch her, that's for sure. She'd say she was going out with the girls all the time, then come home at one or two in the morning with her lipstick all smeared. Her hair would be a mess, half the time her blouse would be undone. If I said anything she'd go into such a tirade, it just wasn't worth it. I knew there was no way she was going to stop anyway, no matter what I said. I just shook my head. How long have you guys been married? The year after graduation. He looked at me and kind of shrugged his shoulders. Like I said, she was the only girl who was ever nice to me. I never really even asked her. One day, when we were in the mall, she dragged me into a jewelry store and pointed to an engagement ring, saying she wanted that one, he said with a snicker. Okay. So now what? I asked. Sounds like you're serious about the divorce. What are you going to do after that? You still going to work for her old man? Yeah, I was thinking about that. I don't know. Lisa would be able to come into the store and harass me anytime she wanted to. I, I don't know what I'd do if I quit, though. I mean, I started out as a stock boy. Mr. Schultz made me a manager when I married Lisa, but I'm still nothing more than a glorified stock boy. Who's going to hire someone my age who's been a stock boy all his life? He had a point. Well, what about going into business for yourself? Do you have any hobbies or anything like that? Maybe something you can do to make some money. He didn't say anything. At first, I thought he was trying to think of something he could do, but when he looked around to see who might overhear him, I realized he had something in mind. He was just ashamed to talk about it. You're, I can't tell you, he said with a sigh. It'll just reinforce what you already think about me. You'll think I'm a sissy. Hell, I knew he was a sissy. I couldn't think of anything that would make me think he was more of a sissy than I thought already. What? Come on, Eugene. What? You collect women's panties or something? What? He couldn't look me in the eye. He dropped his head and took another quick glance around to make sure nobody was in listening range. I, I make dollhouses, he mumbled. It took every ounce of self-control I had not to break out laughing, but I know he could see laughter in my eyes. Yeah, I know, he said. I told you, you'd think I was a sissy. They're pretty nice, though. They're very detailed. I made one for the neighbor's little girl and she loves it. For a second, I wondered how the heck I wound up sitting next to a guy who let his wife kick him out of the house so that she could screw somebody else and on top of that, made dollhouses? Why do I get involved? Why? Which reminds me, do you know anyone with a truck I could borrow? I snuck into the house when Lisa was gone and got the rest of my clothes, but I have a bunch of tools and things in the garage I still have to get. I really need a truck for that. I'd rent one, but the lawyer took almost every cent I have as a retainer. They want like $300 deposit even on a small truck, and I don't have it. I sat there for a minute wondering if I really wanted to get any more involved. Oh, what the hell? I told myself. My dad has a pickup, but he'd never let a stranger drive it. I guess I could drive. I want to do it when your wife's not there, though. Yeah, me too, he grumbled. Thanks, Chase. That'd be great. How about next Tuesday about 7.30? Lisa will be at her folks' house. At least that's where she says she goes every Tuesday. I never checked, but it wouldn't surprise me if she didn't have another boyfriend stashed somewhere. I couldn't help shaking my head again. This guy had lived minus his balls for so long I couldn't see how he'd ever grow a pair. Yeah, I said, trying to keep the disgust from my voice. I have to ask, but I'm sure it'll be okay. That weekend Mel came over with her overnight bag and didn't leave until Sunday afternoon. Needless to say, I didn't think of Eugene at all. In fact, it wasn't until Tuesday morning that I remembered I was supposed to ask my dad for his truck. I drove over to dad and mom's after work, picked up the pickup and headed over to Plato's to meet Eugene. 
We passed his house first to see if there was any sign of life. There was one light on but Eugene said his soon-to-be ex always left the kitchen light on whenever she went out. He pulled out his garage door opener and damn if it didn't still work. I surmised that maybe she still expected him to come crawling back. The rising door cleared the way for my headlights to illuminate the empty space where Lisa's car would normally be parked, but it wasn't until the overhead light was turned on that I was pleasantly surprised. Eugene had a class, a woodworking space, all set up. It was small but impeccably laid out and organized. I turned the ignition off and climbed out of the truck to go take a closer look. The tools were all light duty but top quality. Damn, Eugene, you've got a nice layout here. Thanks, I love building things, he replied. That's when my eyes started to wander some of the shelves above my head. Maybe it was my preconceived ideas about him when he told me about building doll houses, but I never envisioned what I was looking at. They weren't doll houses, they were miniature homes exact in every detail. The workmanship would rival the most skilled master carpenter or cabinet maker. Geez, Eugene, you really built these by hand? Yeah, I told you I make doll houses. Man, you have to come up with a better term for these than doll houses. These are incredible, I gushed. Thanks, Chase. Lisa always told people I played with doll houses. It's nice to see them appreciated by someone other than me. We loaded his tools, then grabbed a couple of thick blankets to insulate the doll houses so they wouldn't get damaged. We drove over to a storage facility he'd rented and unloaded, then headed for Plato's where his car was parked. I had been thinking. Let's stop in for one quick one, I said. The night is still young. He agreed, so we headed inside where Tony had two cold ones waiting for us. I know someone who might be able to help you, I told Eugene. My girlfriend, Mel. She has a BA in marketing. She just might be willing to help you come up with a marketing plan for those dollhouses. Really? You really think I could make money selling them? I don't know. They sure are nice. I don't see why you couldn't. How long does it take to build one? Oh, a couple of days, sometimes three if it's a real complicated one, he told me. Hmm. Okay, don't quit your day job just yet, I warned him. I'll talk to Mel over the weekend and just see what she thinks. We finished our beers and split for home. Eugene was still staying at the motel but was talking about finding a small efficiency apartment. I had to give him credit. So far he'd stood his ground. On Thursday, I got a call from Mel. Every once in a while she'd meet her girlfriends for drinks on a Friday night. The following was going to be one of those nights. I was disappointed because our weekends usually started out on Friday night, but it actually gave me some time to figure out some kind of surprise. The weekend before she showed up at me door with her suitcase and spent the whole weekend with me. The week before that she met me at her place wearing that red lingerie. I had to come up with something for her. Since I wasn't going to see Mel until the following day, I stopped in at Plato's on the way home from work, Friday. Hey, Tony, you know anyone that has a killer recipe for eggs benedict? It was Mel's favorite breakfast, but she was very particular about how they had to be prepared, so she didn't really order them that much. Yeah, he responded, me. Really? I'd like to cook them up for my girlfriend tomorrow morning, but she's pretty fussy about how they're cooked. Absolutely. When they're made the right way, they're delicious, but if you screw them up, they're flat and tasteless. First, you need real Canadian beacon, not ham. The eggs have to be cooked so the yolks are still runny, so they mix with the hollandaise sauce and that has to be thick and tangy. You top it all off with a black olive. I was impressed. Damn, Tony, that's exactly how she likes it. Could you write it all down for me? I'll pay you for it. You don't have to pay me. Call it karma. You're giving your buddy a helping hand, so I'm giving you one. What do they call it? Paying it forward. The following morning, I was parked at Mel's apartment complex. I checked the grocery bags one more time to make sure I had all the ingredients I needed then debated whether I should ring the doorbell yet or not. I knew she probably wanted to sleep in a little after being out with the girls, but I didn't want to wait too long or she might already have had her breakfast. I waited until 8.30 before ringing her bell. After a minute or so I saw the peephole in the door go dark for a second. She hid behind the door as it opened. As I walked in it closed behind me, revealing my favorite girl clad only in a pair of panties. She was yawning with her hand covering her mouth and her eyes were only half open. God, what a sexy sight. I set the bags on the floor, stepped up and kissed her. She wrapped her arms around my neck and gave me a sleepy little grin. What took you so long, she cooed. I smiled. She really was a great gal. You want to eat before or after? She covered her mouth with her hand as she yawed a second time. Before, she tried hard to articulate, I need to wake up. Okay, why don't jump in the shower and rinse off to wake up? I'll get breakfast started. 
Okay, she yawed again while talking. What are you making? It's a surprise, I said while picking up the bags and heading toward the kitchen. I followed Tony's recipe and was just finishing when Mel came down, looking a little more refreshed than earlier. What time did you get in? I asked while laying down a plate of the best-looking eggs Benedict you ever saw. Oh, this looks delicious, honey. I didn't know you were such a gourmet. I hope you like them, I said, sitting down with my own plate. For a second, I thought she was going to ignore my question, but after savoring her first bite of my breakfast masterpiece, she answered me. I didn't get in until after two. Um, honey, these are fantastic. Thanks. Is everything okay? You don't usually come in that late from a night out with the ladies. No, things. Well, with me things are alright, but not with Nancy. She found out her husband has been cheating on her, and she's devastated. We all stayed a lot longer than normal, trying to cheer her up a little. I feel so sorry for her. It's like her whole world collapsed on her. Nancy, is she the tall blonde that has the office behind yours? Yeah, she suddenly looked up at me. Don't get any big ideas there, buckaroo. I'm not giving up anyone who cooks eggs Benedict like this. I smiled. I knew she was BSing, but it was still nice to hear. I just wasn't sure who you were talking about. We talked about her friend while we ate. Her cheating husband reminded me of Eugene, which reminded me of the dollhouses. Honey, I'm sorry to change the subject, but if I don't ask, I'll forget. Ask what? I have a friend who makes wooden dollhouses by hand. They're extremely intricate and detailed. He'd like to be able to make a living doing it, so I told him I'd ask you about marketing them, just to see if you had any ideas. Do I know this friend? No. I used to go to school with him, but we just met up again recently. He's going through a divorce just like Nancy. His wife had been having affairs for a long time. He finally got fed up. Mel was slowly shaking her head at my statement. What is it with all the cheating spouses out there? I don't know, honey. Why get married if you're only going to cheat anyway? I don't get it either. She looked at me and smiled. You know, for a player you've got some very old-fashioned ideas. It's one of the things I like about you. I wasn't sure how to respond, so I just gave her kind of a sidewise grin and shrugged my shoulders. She just smiled. So, he makes wooden dollhouses by hand. How long does it take him to build one? He said two or three days. Well, there's no way he could make a living selling them wholesale, not if they take that long to build. He'd have to retail them. As soon as she said that she stopped and thought for a second. Actually, maybe he could market them as a one-of-a-kind type thing to a niche clientele, maybe through a broker. He'd get a lot more out of them that way. I'd have to see some though. I wouldn't even talk to any brokers unless I knew what I was talking about. That's no problem, I told her. He moved out of his house, but he has a couple in a storage unit over on Dempster. Mel got a mischievous look on her face. Of course, if I help out your friend, I'll expect to be paid for my services. In remuneration, I expect some extra time with you eating at the Y. Now it was my turn to grin. I have never been happier to pay a debt. Good. Then you can start right now, she declared. Are you staying the night? Yeah. I have some clean clothes in the car. That's my man, she commented with a chuckle. Why don't you call your friend and see if we can meet him at his storage locker tomorrow sometime? I'd like to see these dollhouses. Then meet me in the bedroom. With those parting words and an evil smile, she left the kitchen and headed toward the bedroom. I quickly pulled out my phone and called Eugene. We arranged to meet the next day at 2. With that done, I sprinted toward Shangri-La, ready to start Mel's compensation. I stripped off my clothes in the living room before even getting to the bedroom. When I walked in, I acted as if I was looking for someone. Let's see now, I said, out loud. She said she'd be the naked one. Oh, I think I see her. Mel giggled. Will you quit clowning around and get on down here, she said with a big smile. Eugene was anxiously waiting in his car when we pulled up. I introduced him and Mel before he unlocked the storage locker. Mel took a look and I knew she was having the same reaction I had the first time I saw them. Oh my god, Eugene, you made these yourself? They're absolutely gorgeous. Thanks. I've been making things since I was a kid. I started making dollhouses about five years ago, but it's just been a hobby. Chase was the one who thought I might be able to sell them. Okay, I've seen enough, said Mel, after looking over the second model. How many of these can you make in, let's say the next two or three weeks? But they have to be this quality, no shortcuts. Ah, well I've got a problem right now. These lockers don't have any electricity. I need some place to work that is power. How big of a place do you need? Oh, it doesn't have to be big. This would be big enough in size if it had electricity. I could see the wheels turning in Mel's head as she glanced around the room. Okay. The apartment complex where I'm staying has garages just about this size. 
I rent one for my car, and they do have electricity. I guess my car could stay outside for a while, at least until you can find another place to set up. Eugene was almost overwhelmed with gratitude. He couldn't stop thanking her. I got the impression he hadn't had a lot of nice things done for him by other people, before. I guess that means I have to borrow my dad's truck again, I interjected. Do. The timid Eugene started to emerge again. Do you mind, Chase? No, not at all. If Mel believes in you enough to let her Lexus sit outside, then I believe in you too. I. I could see tears welling up in his eyes as he tried to speak. I don't know how I'll ever thank you both of you. No one's ever been nice to me like this. He finally got out. We made plans to get his tools over to Mel's then she, and I headed over to Denny's for a late lunch. That man is so sweet, Mel remarked on the drive over. Yeah, he's a nice guy. I just wish he had some balls. He used to get picked on constantly in school, even by kids smaller than him. They could do anything they wanted to him, and he'd never fight back. Shit, his wife literally kicked him out of his own house so she could screw her lover and all he did was cry and whine about it. I thought you said he was divorcing her? He is, now. Ah, I think I might have had something to do with that. I'm proud of him, though. So far he's sticking to his guns. Some people just don't like confrontation, I guess. Not everyone can be a he-man like my chase, she said with big smile. Clowning around, I lightly beat my chest with my fists and did a quiet Tarzan yell. That got a laugh out of her. He may not be a tough guy, but he sure is talented. Those dollhouses are something else, she said. Don't tell him yet. I don't want to disappoint him if I can't pull it off, but I may know just the person to sell those for him. Jason Truel. He's a broker that deals in nothing but high-end specialty items for the rich and powerful. This is just the kind of thing he might be interested in. That Tuesday we moved Eugene's stuff and set it up in Mel's small garage. He was as excited as a little kid and we all three went out to eat afterward. We talked about dollhouses for a while, then Mel changed the subject. So Eugene, Chase tells me you're in the process of a divorce. I'm sorry to hear that. Any chance of you and your wife getting back together? No, none, he answered. You know what they say, Eugene, if you fall off the horse you have to get right back up again. I was wondering just where Mel was going with this. Do you have any special someone waiting in the wings, she asked. He looked embarrassed, maybe ashamed. No, I've never been very good with women. They don't like me too much. I, I guess maybe I'm too shy or something, he muttered. Nonsense, said Mel. You're a good looking guy. You just need to get out there. Give someone a chance to know you a little. Hey, I have an idea. I knew it. I knew Mel was leading up to something. There's a girl at work I think you should meet, she continued. Not Nancy, I said, breaking into her little soliloquy. No, not Nancy. Actually, her husband came back asking for a second chance. I think she's making a mistake, but she let him move back in, and they're going to marriage counseling. No, Bev, Mr. Jansen's secretary. She's cute, intelligent, personable, and single. I looked at Eugene. He looked scared again, but Mel was relentless. What to say, Eugene? Maybe we could double date, she blurted out before I could stop her. I didn't mind helping the guy out, but I wasn't too keen on him tagging along with Mel and me. Unfortunately, there wasn't much I could do. The invitation was out there. I saw Eugene's eyes brighten right up. Yeah, double date with you and Chase? Well, you really think she'd like me? Mel continued to get us in deeper. I don't know, but there's only one way to find out. What do you say? I can see if she's free, and if so, we can set something up for this Friday. It didn't surprise me when he jumped at the offer. Once again, I reminded myself to never ever get involved in someone else's affairs. Since I wouldn't have a chance to stop in on Friday night, due to our double date, I stopped off to converse with Tony over a beer on Thursday, after work. As soon as I sat down, he served my beer with a question. You got a new squeeze? He caught me off guard. A new squeeze? As in girlfriend? No, why would you think that? He leaned his elbow on the bar as he talked. Some chick's been in here every night this week looking for you. Hmm, what she look like? Ah, about five six, bleached blonde hair, maybe 10 or 15 pounds overweight but not bad. That sounds like Lisa, Eugene's soon-to-be ex-wife. She's looking for me? Tony just nodded. Great. The next time she comes and tell her you haven't seen me and heard I was hanging out in some other bar but you don't know which one. Maybe you should tell her. She just walked in and is standing right behind you, he told me with a slight chuckle. Hi, Lisa, I said without turning to face her. She sat down on the bar stool next to me. Hello, Chase. It took me a little while, but I finally figured out who you were. I kind of remember you from school. How did you know where to find me? She ordered a white wine before answering. 
You're fairly well known around town. I just asked around. Okay, so you found me. What do you want, Lisa? I want to know what gives you the right to poke your nose into other people's business. We were happily married before you came along. I had to laugh. Maybe you were happily married, but your husband sure wasn't. Let me ask you a question. What gives you the right to treat him like he was shit under your shoe? He's my husband. I can treat him any damn way I want, she spewed. Maybe so, but he also has the right to walk out any time he wants, I responded. That seemed to set her back on her heels a little. Look, I didn't come down here to argue with you, Chase. I want you to tell Eugene all is forgiven so he can come home. I know what I said about making his life miserable, but I'm not mad anymore. I promised to treat him better. Like, I was going to believe that. Lisa, you know he's still working at your dad's grocery store. Go tell him yourself. I can't. My dad forbids me to go into the store to talk to him. He's afraid I'll make a scene. I think he's kind of pissed at me. Look, Lisa, according to Eugene, he's not interested in crawling back to you. As you so kindly put it. You blew it. Accept it and move on. Okay. I blew it, but he listens to you. I just want you to tell him I deserve another chance. I promise I'll treat him better. No more other men. Sorry, Lisa. I'm afraid I don't believe you. And I doubt that Eugene would either. What do you care? Anyway, you're daddy's only little girl. You'll have money for the rest of your life. I'm sure there are a ton of guys out there that would sell their manhood for a taste of the good life. She sighed and slumped her shoulders. I miss him. I miss having him with me. You should have thought of that before driving him away. She looked at me with anger in her eyes. He wouldn't have gone if it hadn't been for you. The least you could do is put in a kind word for me. You're wrong there, Lisa. All I did was give him a kick in the pants. He would have left you eventually anyway. Eugene is finally starting to find himself. Leave him alone. Go ruin someone else's life. I could see the anger in her eyes intensify. This isn't over, she snarled. She downed the rest of her wine in one gulp and left. Tony came right over. Wow, you really let her have it, my friend. You heard. Oh yeah, I didn't miss a word. Is she really that big of a witch? Worse, I replied. She was on her best behavior just then, I joked. I stayed, nursed a couple beers and talked to Tony until 10, then went home. I always like to get to bed early on a Thursday night, so I had plenty of energy for my weekends. The next night we all met at my place. It was more centrally located than Mel's. She brought Bev with her. Eugene showed up a couple minutes later. Being the de facto host, I made everyone a drink so we could all sit and get acquainted before leaving for the restaurant. I had seen Bev in Mel's office once or twice but didn't know her at all. She seemed a little shy herself. I could see why Mel thought they might make a good couple. During the course of conversation, Bev asked Eugene about his dollhouses. Mel had obviously told her a little about them. At first, he was hesitant to talk about them, probably thinking she would see him as everyone else did. A sissy. But Mel was good at drawing people out. Once she got him talking, we almost couldn't shut him up again. Dinner came off without a hitch. Both Eugene and Bev seemed to be emerging from their reticent shells a little and Mel nudged me a couple times when she caught them looking at each other. From there we went dancing. Eugene wasn't very light on his feet, but Bev just laughed off his clumsiness. The entire evening went well, well enough, in fact, that we repeated it the following month. In spite of Lisa's ridiculous attempts at reconciliation, Eugene pressed forward with the divorce. He really was done with his ex, there was no doubt about it. For the first time since I'd known him, I could see subtle changes. He was becoming ever so slightly more confident in himself. During the day, he still worked for Lisa's father in the store, but his evenings were spent in Mel's garage building his dollhouses, except for Wednesdays when he went in his self-defense classes. I walked into Plato's on a Monday night after work. Tony just about fainted. Is the sky falling or something? He asked. I've never seen you in here on a Monday. Hi, Tony, I said with a forced smile. No, I'm just a little aggravated. I need a beer and an ear. Beer and ear. Hey, I like that, he chuckled. If I ever scrape enough together for my own place, that's what I'm going to name it. The beer and ear. Thanks. Don't mention it, I grumbled. So what's got you so down? Mel, I just spent the weekend with her, and all she did was talk the whole time about Eugene and how talented he is. He makes these wooden doll houses, and she's going to help him sell some of them. I mean, I like the guy and I'm glad she's helping him out, but damn it. Just then my phone rang. I looked at the screen and saw it was Mel. Well, I said to Tony, she's probably calling to apologize. I hit the connect button. Hi, gorgeous. Hi, Chase. Listen, I wanted to call before you made any plans for next weekend. I have to go out of town. We're leaving Friday night, 
after work and won't be back until Monday night. We? Who's we? I asked. Eugene and I. We're going to New York to see Jason. He's the guy I was telling you about when you first asked me to help. The broker. Eugene has built up a pretty good inventory. We're taking four different style houses up to show him. We have no way of safely packing them for a plane ride, so we have to drive up there and back. I don't know anything about marketing, but I couldn't understand why they had to go all the way to New York just to find somebody to sell those things. Oh well, what could I say? I knew she was good at her job, and I could hear the excitement in her voice. Besides, I was the one who thought of getting Mel involved in the first place. Okay, maybe we can get together some night this week. Ah, possibly, but we'll have to play it by ear. I'm still negotiating with Jason contingent on his acceptance to broker for Eugene, and we still have to make arrangements for accommodations in New York while we're there. There's a lot to do, so I can't promise. I really was starting to regret ever getting Mel involved. How about if I call you Wednesday after work? That'd be fine, honey. But remember, I'm making no promises. Yeah, I got it, I answered. Mel evidently didn't hear the little anger in my voice. Or if she did, she didn't say anything. We said our goodbyes and hung up. Tony had been standing just a few feet away, washing glasses. Bad news. Yeah, kind of, Mel has to go to New York over the weekend. That is a shame. Hey, I know a perky little blonde who's on the make if you're looking for company. I chuckled. We never actually came out and said it, but almost from the start, Mel and I had an understanding. I hadn't dated anyone but her since our third date, and I know she's been true to me as well. No thanks, Tony. I appreciate the thought. I guess I can survive one weekend. I'll tell what though. I know I've said this before, but this time I really mean it. If you ever see me meddling in someone's business again, promise me you'll kick my bum all the way back home. He looked up at the ceiling like he was considering what I said. Hmm, that could be fun. Okay, I promise, he said, lightheartedly. Wednesday turned out to be a really crappy day at work. On top of that, Mel wasn't answering her phone, so by the time I got home, I was in a really bad mood. Until I walked up to my apartment door and found a sultry-looking Mel leaning against the jam. She held up a white bag. I brought Chinese, she said with a grin. God, she was like a beacon on a foggy night. I wrapped my arms around her and pressed my lips to hers in a duel of tongues. We had sex and our breathing was ragged and heavy as we both fought for control of our own bodies. Slowly, Mel's legs loosened their grip and eventually moved to support her. I heard her laugh. If I'd had known that was going to happen, I would have brought Chinese a long time ago. In spite of still trying to calm down, it was too funny not to laugh. We both pulled ourselves together enough to get to the kitchen table and eat. I was hoping she'd stay over, but she said she had to get going. I told her to drive careful and she was off. Friday night, I didn't walk into Pluto's until 9.30. Since there wasn't anything else to do, I had stayed late to catch up on some things at work. I knew Mel and Eugene had been on the road for a few hours already and was disappointed that she didn't call to say goodbye before leaving. About 11, I was just getting ready to head on home when my phone rang. I wondered who would be calling so late. I should have known. Hi, gorgeous. Don't tell me you're there already. Hi, honey. No, we won't get into New York until about 6 in the morning. I started out driving but Eugene took over about an hour ago so I could get some rest. We just passed Youngstown, Ohio. I'm going to try and grab 40 winks, but before I do, I thought I'd give you a call for some phone sex. I heard her laugh. You should see how red Eugene just got when I said that, she chuckled again. Don't worry, Eugene. I'm only kidding, she told him. Damn it, I said into the phone. Tell him to hold his hands over his ears if he doesn't want to hear. No, wait, he's driving. That's not a good idea, I joked back. I just wanted to call. The weekend's going to be a very busy, so I doubt if I'll get a chance to talk again until next week. Okay, babe, I wish you and Eugene all the luck in the world. Drive safe and call me when you can. We finished the call with a couple of phone kisses. Tony overheard my end of the conversation. You should marry that girl, Chase. She seems like a keeper to me. Tony, if I was the marrying kind I think I would have popped the question months ago. I guess I'm just one of those guys that all the women talk about. You know, afraid of commitment. I tossed some money on the bar and took off for home. It was the first Friday night in months where I was in bed before midnight. I mean to sleep. I didn't hear from her again until the following Monday evening. Hi, handsome. Hi yourself, gorgeous. How did it go? Well, Jason's playing it close to the vest, but he does that when he's negotiating his commission structure. He really liked the models though. I could tell. He said he'd let us know by the end of the week. That's great, honey. I have my fingers crossed for you. Thanks, Han.
I wanted to call you and let you know we were back, but I'm beat from the long drive. I'm going to hit the sack. I have to be at work tomorrow. I could tell from her voice that she was exhausted. Okay, babe. I'm glad you called, though. I'd have been worried if you hadn't. We said our goodbyes and hung up. It was still too early for me to go to bed, so I grabbed a beer from the fridge and sat down to relax in my lounge chair. For some reason, I couldn't shake Tony's words from my brain. You should marry that girl. I couldn't believe I was even thinking about it. I've seen too many of my buddies trapped in bad marriages. I have one friend, Jack, who married the love of his life straight out of high school. Only three years later, he found out she was cheating on him. He went searching for the a-hole she was screwing and caught up with him in bar on the other side of town. He went after the guy, but unfortunately for Jack, the guy not only whipped his bum, but a couple of the guy's buddies jumped in as well. Jack spent three weeks in the hospital. On top of it, his wife got more than her share in the divorce. These days, if you mention his ex-wife's name, you'd better duck. He hates her with a passion and still says he's going to get even someday. No, there's just too many, what ifs, to risk getting married. I would consider asking her to move in with me, though. With that thought in mind, I finished my beer and went to bed. Thursday, since I hadn't heard from Mel, I thought I'd give her a call and see if she made any plans for the weekend. Chase, I was just about to call you. She squealed into the phone sounding more like a little girl than her adult self. Guess what? I don't know, but it must be pretty good, I joked. Oh, it's more than just pretty good. It's fantastic. Jason not only has agreed to represent Eugene, but he's already sold two of his houses. Isn't that great? Now I'll admit, it was good news, especially after they drove all the up there to see the guy, but I was having a hard time matching Mel's enthusiasm. That's great, honey. You both should be very proud of yourselves. You both did a great job, I told her, trying to sound a little more excited than I really was. I was wondering if you had anything special you wanted to do this weekend. Maybe we can celebrate your success some way. It's already planned, she said. We're all going to meet at Plato's at 7. From there, Eugene is taking us all to dinner, and then we're going dancing. Oh, Chase, wear something nice. It doesn't have to be a suit, but wear maybe a sport coat, okay? A sport coat? I questioned. Yeah, he said he was taking us someplace nice for dinner. Okay, I'll bring a sport coat. Once again, I was feeling a little put out. I was really looking forward to a quiet weekend of sex, sex, and more sex with Mel. I sighed quietly to myself. I guess I can put up with Eugene for a few hours. Friday night, I walked into Plato's right on time. It's waiting for you, Tony said, with a nod of his head. I looked over to the booths and saw Eugene signaling to me. He was sitting with Bev. Mel had her back to me. That was something else that irked me a little. I've always had this idiosyncrasy about sitting with my back to the door. Oh well, I said to myself. I guess I can put up with it for a little while. As I walked to the booth, I thought. I seem to be telling myself that a lot, lately. Hi, gorgeous, I said to Mel as I slid in next to her. I put my arm around her and gave her a kiss. Em, she moaned with a smile as our lips parted. Under the table, I felt her hand stealthily move to my crotch and her smile widened. I missed you, she said. Prove it, I responded. Later, she promised. Eugen was dying to tell me. Chase. Did Melanie tell you the good news? Yes, she did. Congratulations. Thanks. I owe it all to you and Melanie. It sounded strange to hear someone call Mel by her full first name. Hardly anyone ever did that. I looked at her. Melanie? Yeah, she replied. On the way up to New York, he asked me what Mel stood for. I think Melanie is a pretty name, so I asked if she minded if I called her that. Eugene chimed in. I said no provided he didn't mind if I called him Jean, said Mel. I found it amusing. Okay, so we're using your full name but cutting his, I said with a chuckle. As I looked up I saw Eugene glancing up in the direction of the bar. It was the second or third time I saw him do that. Something wrong, I asked. No, he answered, not too convincingly. Bev noticed it too. Do you know them? She asked. I turned my head to see who she was talking about. There was a guy and a girl sitting at the bar. The guy looked vaguely familiar but he was blocking my view of the girl. Didn't he go to school with us? Yeah, answered Jean. He was a year ahead of us. He walked in with Lisa just as you sat down. Lisa? Yeah, you probably can't see her, but she's sitting on the other side of him. I could see the guy glancing over at us and snickering. I saw it was in fact Lisa when she leaned forward and looked our way while laughing. They were making it very plain that Jean was the source of their amusement. You want me to have Tony kick them out? I asked. No, I couldn't care less who she sleeps with these days. I did think she had better taste than him, though. 
Tony was pretty busy, so he wasn't paying much attention when the two of them got up and headed our way. I started to stand up, but Eugene said he would handle it. I sat poised as they reached our booth, just in case. They both stood next to Eugene and loomed over him. Eugene looked up at them with a greeting. Hello, Pete, Lisa. Well, if it isn't Eugene, Pete said, stretching out the name probably the same way he did in school. Some people just never grow up. Lisa looked over at Bev. Who's she? Some 304 you picked up. Before anyone could even say anything, Bev came back with a quick retort. No, Lisa, I already took your husband from you. I wouldn't want to take your customers too. To say the look on Lisa's face was comical is an understatement, but the comment gave Pete the opening he was looking for to challenge Gene. Eugene, your 304 owes my girlfriend an apology. He leaned down and grabbed Gene's shirt. Either she says she's. Like a flash, Gene grabbed his hand and twisted it backwards, bringing Pete to his knees. Before he even realized what was happening, Gene was standing over him, adding just enough pressure to make Pete scream something about breaking his arm. Lisa was more surprised than I was. She screamed at Gene and was about to attack him when Tony suddenly appeared and grabbed her. What the hell is going on? yelled Tony. I filled him in. This a-hole came in with Gene's ex trying to make trouble. I looks like Gene has it handled though, Tony. Gene released his grip on Pete's arm so Tony could usher them out. Come one, you two. I'll say this politely only once, I want you out of here, and I don't want to see either of you in here again, Tony told them in his official voice. I watched as Tony escorted them away. As they got as far as the bar, Lisa looked back at us. She had tears in her eyes. At that moment I realized that somehow, in her own twisted way, she actually did care for Jean. I almost felt sorry for her, almost. After throwing them out, Tony came back and gave us a round on the house. I can't tell you how impressed I was. I knew Eugene had been taking self-defense lessons, but... He thanked Tony for the free beers, then expressed his regrets to everyone. We sat and talked through our free round, but it was getting time to go. Eugene. Gene wouldn't say where we were going to eat, just to follow him. A few minutes later, we pulled up in front of Shea Paul, probably the finest and most expensive restaurant within a 50-mile radius. Now, aren't you glad I told you to bring a sport coat? Mel said as I she looked over to me while the parking attendant opened her door for her. I got out my side, grabbed my sport coat off the hanger and back, slipped it on, and escorted my girl into the restaurant right behind our host and his girl. Gene was grinning from ear to ear as he gave his name to the maitre d. We were shown to our table and Gene was given the wine list. He passed it to me saying he wasn't that familiar with wine and asked if I would pick out a good one. I was a little uncomfortable because of the prices. I figured I'd be pulling my own credit card out before the end of the night. By the time we were finished we all agreed that Shay Paul had earned its reputation. The check came encased in a little black leather folder which our waiter inconspicuously laid beside our host. I got a little nervous for Eugene. With the bottle of wine and dessert, I had roughly calculated the bill to be in the vicinity of $350. I was contemplating taking him aside and offering to help pay, but before I could figure out how to get him alone, he withdrew four, crisp $100 bills from his wallet and stuffed them into the case. Then handed it back to the waiter telling him no change was necessary. Okay. Again, I was impressed. From there we went to Spigots, a higher-end dance club. People who went there usually knew how to dance. I could hold my own, but again I was nervous for Jane. Shortly after being shown to a table and ordering drinks, I asked Mel to dance. As we started to walk out to the floor, I heard Jean asking Bev to dance as well. As we tripped the light fantastic, I noticed Mel watching them with a small smile. I looked over and watched as Jean glided around the floor with Bev in his arms. It was my third surprise for the night. Mel saw the look on my face. I've been giving him a few dance lessons, she told me. It looks like he was a good student. I commented back. As the night wore on, we spent a little less time dancing and more time at the table, talking. Gene started telling us of his plans for quitting his job and renting space where he could build the doll houses full time. I was happy for him, but it sounded like he was going off half cocked and could get himself in financial trouble real quick. I thought I should try to bring him back down to earth a little. Gene, I'm happy for you, but maybe you should reconsider quitting your job, at least for a little while. What if this guy doesn't sell anymore? I was surprised that Mel seemed to be supporting his plans. She was usually a pretty level-headed girl. Chase, Jason already has orders coming in, she informed me. All right, still. I mean, you said you can only make about three per week, right? And from what Mel says, this guy is taking a pretty good cut of the pie. Gene got a serious look on his face and looked at Mel. 
I didn't tell him everything, she said. He has no idea. Jean looked back at me. Chase, Jason is not your usual wholesaler. He's a broker who sells things to some of the richest people in the world. Those two doll houses he sold went to some Middle Eastern sheik who owns a ton of oil wells. The guy bought them for his two daughters. He paid $20,000 apiece for them. I was just taking a swig from my long neck. When I heard $20,000 apiece, I gasped, opening my palate and forcing my beer out through my nose in a humiliating spay of snot and hops. Mel starting patting me on the back as I grabbed for a napkin. Are you all right? She asked with a slight chuckle in her voice. I was still coughing and unable to answer her except to nod my head. It was so embarrassing. I knew everyone was looking at me, so I excused myself and headed for the washroom. 20000 apiece, I kept saying to myself as I blew my nose and got cleaned up. It looked like the waitress had come over and cleaned up the table while I was in the men's room. I apologized as I sat back down. I'm sorry, Chase. I should have broken it to you a little more subtly. I knew you had no idea how much I was getting paid, he said. No, no, that's okay, I assured him. I guess congratulations really are in order. He's already got orders for four more, but I have to make a custom shipping container for each one. Something that will protect them well enough to be shipped overseas. I'm working on them right now. Jason gets the orders, and I drop ship right to the customer. I get paid by wire transfer before I even ship. It was all negotiated by Melanie. She's really something, he said, looking at her with gratitude. I knew my girl was good at her job, but I never realized how good. We talked a little longer, but since we hadn't had sex in over a week, I knew Mel had to be as horny as I was, so we all broke up and headed home. I figured Jean and Bev would be doing the same as Mel and me before the night was over. Good for him, I thought. That night it was off the scales. Whether it was the exhilaration from a job well done or simply being absence of sex, I didn't care. She was ravenous. We did it almost whole night. Mel loves post coital cuddling, and I can't say I mind it either, especially with her. As we lay, wrapped in each other's arms, Eugene's revelation wandered back into my head. 20,000, I muttered, just a hair over a whisper. I heard Mel chuckle and felt her nod her head as it rested on my chest. Yup, 20,000. Jason gets 50% of that though. Wow, really? 50% just for being the middleman? He's more than just a middleman, Chase. He and a handful of others are legendary in my business. They're the James Bond of marketing, rogues who are self-employed and deal with an extremely select clientele. I met him a couple years ago at a convention, downtown. We hit it off, and I spent the night with him. Suddenly, my whole body tensed up. Mel felt it and looked up at me. I'm sure the concern was written all over my face because she took one look and knew exactly what I was thinking. No, I didn't screw him in New York, she said. I stayed with him for two nights at the convention, but that was over two years ago, before I met you, and I haven't seen him since until last week. And that was all business. Knowing she just relieved my anxiety, she continued. Anyway, normally Jason works for the buyer. Some Maharaja somewhere decides he wants a new yacht or private jet, so he calls Jason, gives him all the specifications and tells him what all he wants on it, and Jason goes to work finding an exact match. He's made as much as a million bucks on a single sale. Damn. If he makes that much on the big stuff, how come he's fooling with the doll houses at 10 grand a pop? Because the big stuff doesn't come along every day. The people he deals with always has to have the best, no matter what it is, it has to be the best money can buy. And they're willing to pay top dollar for it, whatever it is. When word gets out about the doll houses, he'll just sit back and take orders. He'll sell hundreds, maybe thousands before his clients move on to something else. Jesus, Gene will be set for life. What about you? Don't you get anything out of all this? Well, I wasn't going to take anything. I was doing it as a favor to you, but Gene is insisting you, and I both take a small percentage of the company. He wants to give me 10 shares of stock. He's going to give you some too. Don't tell him I told you, though. He wants to tell you himself. Shares? He's got a company with shares already? Yeah, well, we had to figure out some way to make sure his ex couldn't claim anything before the divorce was settled. We told Jason, and he showed us how to do it. We formed a corporation and registered it in Delaware. That's one of the states that has the most relaxed corporate regulations in the country. Then the corporation issued 200 shares of stock. Right now they're all in my name, but after Gene's divorce is final, I'll transfer the shares to him. All but the 10 he wants me to keep. Wow, you guys really were busy, weren't you? Yeah, that's why I didn't get a chance to call you. We never had a minute to ourselves the whole time we were there. Well... It's nice of Gene to offer me some shares, but I'm not going to take his money. Tell him to tack my shares onto yours. 
You're the one who worked for it, not me. You'll have to work it out with Jean, honey. He was pretty adamant about you getting something for all your help. As it was, Jean corralled me in Plato's a few nights later. He made his offer and gave me a lot of flack when I refused. After some negotiating, we settled on a payment plan. He bought the beer from then on. He wasn't too happy, but it was something I could live with. Jean called Tony over and told him all my beers were on him from now on, then ordered another for both of us. After taking his first swig, he started the second topic of conversation. Would you believe Lisa came to the motel to apologize for the other night? To tell you the truth, it doesn't surprise me that much. She already looked like she was sorry for what happened when Tony booted them out that night. What did she say? Well, I guess she had a long talk with her dad. Somehow he must have heard about what happened. She said he was furious with her. From what she said, he must have laid down the law to her pretty good. He told her he was disappointed in her. That had to hurt. He's everything to her. I think he made her finally realize how she treats people, how she treated me. He took a small sigh. Chase she cried. Real tears. I'd never seen her cry before. She literally begged me to give her another chance. You going to do it? I asked him. No, it's too late. There's too much water under the bridge. I don't believe anyone can change that quickly and that completely. I'd always be waiting for the old Lisa to reappear. Every time she went out somewhere I'd wonder if it was to meet a guy. He took another drink then continued. No, but who knows, maybe she'll treat her next husband with some respect. Over the next few months, things rolled right along. Lisa was history. The divorce was final and she had no claim on Jean's new business. For him, the money was rolling in, and consequently, Mel was making a bundle as well. Me? I had a good job, drove a new car, and had a nice apartment. That's all I required. I was proud of the things I had because I'd worked hard for them. Anything more I wanted or needed, I would work to get it, myself. The free beer was nice though. Then came the call from Mel. She sounded concerned about something and said we needed to talk but wouldn't tell me what it was about. I agreed to meet her after work at Plato's. I got there a couple minutes before she did and had two beers sitting in front of me when she walked in. I slid over to let her sit beside me but she took a seat on the other side of the booth. Hi, she said with a nervous smile as she reached over to take her Miller's light. Hi, honey, I responded, wondering if I should smile or not. I was starting to get anxious myself. Something was definitely up. Mel was having a hard time looking me in the eye. She began nervously playing with a napkin as she started talking. Chase, there's no easy way. I was concentrating so much on trying to figure out what was going on, I didn't even see Jean walk in until he was standing right next to us. Both Mel and I looked up at him at the same time. Mel spoke right up. What are you doing here? I told you I would handle this, she said with a little aggravation in her voice. Did you really think I'd let you face him alone? He countered. Mel moved over and Jean sat down next to her. It struck me that there was something definitely wrong with this picture. Mel should be sitting next to me, not him. It didn't take a genius to figure out what was coming next. There was no way to keep the anger out of my voice. You two are screwing around behind my back? I snarled. No, no, Chase, we'd never do that to you. Jean jumped in quickly trying to defend their honor. But we have been talking, Chase, Mel added. We, we want to explore a relationship together. My eyes were diverted to her. Chase, you're a fantastic guy. You really are. But let's face it, you're not real big on committed relationships. We've been going together for over a year, and we've had some great times. But as a couple, we're no closer now than we were when we first started dating. I need more. I want a husband, Chase. I want a man who is there for me 24-7. I want children, a family. I want the house with the white, picket fence. I want it all, Chase. I sat there and heard the words, but my rising anger wouldn't allow them to penetrate. I looked at Eugene again. What about Bev? I thought you and her had something going. You just going to dump her? Chase, she's dating two other guys besides me. She has no real feelings for me. When I told her we couldn't see each other again, she simply said, Okay, and that was it. I sat there still not believing my ears or my eyes. Chase, I know what you're thinking and you're wrong. Jean and I have not slept together. We hadn't even kissed until last night, but we've been working together, and the more time we've spent with each other, the more we found we have in common. We both want the same things out of life. Chase, I still want you and I to be friends, just not with the benefits part. Me too, Chase, Jean eagerly added. I really hope this won't affect our friendship. I've never been the kind of guy that could sit and calmly contemplate all the nuances of a situation before doing something. 
I was a reactionary kind of guy, and I usually went with what my gut was telling me in the moment. And in that moment, all I could see was a friend who I had helped and my girl stabbing me in the back. It was cheating, and it hurt. I hope you two will be very happy together. I snidely cursed as I stood. I pulled out a tin and threw it on the table. I'll pay for my own beers, I said with as much venom as I could. Don't either of you ever call me your friend again. Don't call me. Don't stop by. I never want to see either of you ever again. And, Jean, if you ever try to contact me or approach me, I don't care how tough you think you are. So help me God. I'll knock you into the middle of next week. Chase, wait please. Cried Mel as I walked away. I heard Tony call my name, asking what was wrong as I left, but I didn't answer him. I had to get out of there. I couldn't believe my eyes were tearing up as I drove home. I'd never cried over a woman before. You, stop your crying. She's only another 304, I told myself. When I got home, I made a dash for a cold one from the fridge. I hadn't drunk much of the one I left behind. I couldn't believe how much I was hurting. I took a couple swigs of brew while my mind swirled in an endless pattern of chaos. Should I fight for her? I wondered. Should I drive back and tell her I loved her? Did I love her? I knew I loved having sex with her, but was that the same? It must be. Why else would I hurt so badly? But if I did, could I really go through with it? Could I give her all the things she wanted? That was the $64 question, and to tell you the truth, I couldn't answer it. Finally, after two more beers and a never-ending sea of unanswerable questions, I drifted off to sleep in my chair. I had work the next day, but that Friday, after leaving the office, I did something I hadn't done in years. I threw my tent and trusty fly rod in the trunk of my car and went camping. I guess I'm strange that way. They say misery loves company. You'd think I'd shoot right over to Plato's and drown my sorrows in beer, but that wasn't me. When I felt like shit, I liked being alone. I found a quiet little place along the Vermilion River where I set up camp and caught dinner. It was too hot to sleep in the tent, so I set up my hammock later that night. There's nothing like nature to bring things into perspective. I laid back, stuck my hands behind my head and gazed up at the night sky. It was filled with twinkling stars. An army of crickets played love songs on their hind legs in the rippling waters of the Vermilion added to the tranquility that only the night can offer. It was then that I had my answer. Did I love Mel? I had to be honest with myself. No, at least not like she needed to be loved. If I did, I wouldn't be where I was. I'd be at her side, fighting with everything I had to keep her. No, she was right. It still felt like a cheating. Maybe because I had brought them together in the first place, I don't know. There's nothing like losing a girlfriend to make a person do an introspective analysis. Maybe I was mellowing because the thought of actually marrying someone no longer made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Mel was the closest I'd ever come to falling in love. That told me that just maybe there is someone out there, someone who I will fight to keep for the rest of my life. It was almost two months later by the time I walked into Plato's again. I'm not sure why it took so long. I guess I just didn't want to return to the scene of the crime. Tony looked shocked when I walked in. Jesus, you were still alive. I'd given up on you, he said, setting down my usual. No, I'm still around, just haven't felt very sociable, I guess. Yeah, I can understand that. I'd be pissed too. If it's any consolation, Mel cried her eyes out after you left that night. I knew Tony was trying to give me some support, but he wasn't helping. No, it's really not. She was right, Tony. Mel wants the whole domestic thing and she knew I'd never give it to her. We were just so damn good together in the bedroom, and that's tough to let go of. I saw Tony smile. I knew you'd come around, he said. She's been in here a couple times since then. Yeah? They still together. As far as I know. She asked me if I thought you'd ever forgive her. What did you tell her? That it had to be a shock, that I was sure you felt cheated, especially by Eugene. But I also told her that in time, after the pain died down, you'd look at it from a rational standpoint, that you'd realize they didn't do it to hurt you. Then I told her something she already knew, that you were a stand-up guy and I was confident that you would not only forgive them, but someday they'd be able to call you friend again. I must admit, you had me worried though when you stopped coming in. I was beginning to wonder if I'd misjudged you. You're a pretty smart fella, Tony. I just needed some time to be alone. I wasn't ready to share my gloom with anybody, not even with you. So if I see Mel again, is it okay to tell her you forgive her? I know it would mean a lot to her. I thought about it for a few seconds before I answered him. For just an instant, I toyed with the idea of letting her dangle just a little longer. Then I admonished myself for the thought. Yeah, go ahead. He smiled again. You're a good man, Chase. 
I guess he felt we'd covered the subject of Mel and Eugen because he leaned both elbows on the bar in front of me and rested his chin in his hands. Now he said, since I haven't seen you in a while, who you banging these days? I laughed at his subtleness. Nobody, Tony, not a soul. I do have to get out there again, though. My self-imposed exile ends tonight. I stated with nod of my head while hitting the bar with my fist for emphasis. By the end of the following week, I had a date with Charlene, a cute little number I met at the grocery store. Unfortunately, she wasn't my type. All she wanted to do was talk, even during sex. After Charlene came Sandy, then Michelle and Eva. Then there was Carol. Carol was insatiable. She'd come over three or four times a week to drain me, then leave me for dead. Ah, uh, but what a way to go. It had been seven months from the night of Mel and Eugene's announcement. I was sitting on my usual bar stool listening to Tony pontificate about owning his own bar someday when he looked past me and stopped talking. I looked behind me. His shoulders no longer drooped. He stood straight and carried himself, not with arrogance, but with confidence. He took a seat next to me. Beers are on me, Tony. Mel, I had forgiven. I still wasn't so sure about Eugene. I didn't say a word while I sat there trying to decide what I was going to do. I saw your car in the lot as I was driving by, he said. Good for you, I replied, staring straight ahead. Mel says you've forgiven her. I guess that doesn't apply to me, though, does it? I didn't say anything. I love her, Chase, and she loves me. I still didn't say anything. I'm sorry, Chase. I really am. I'm sorry it was Mel. I wish it was anyone but her because I know you cared for her, but would you have married her? Were you prepared to spend the rest of your life with her, to give her children and a home? I guess we'll never know, will we? I spit out. Yeah, I was being a prick. I didn't care. Oh, there was no doubt I'd wind up wishing them a happy life together someday, but I had to get it out of my system. I heard him sigh. When Mel said you were in a forgiving mood, I prayed it extended to me, too. You're the only real friend I ever had. We're getting married next May, he said while pulling something from his wallet. My number's on the card, he said, dropping the business card on the bar. I know you're going to think I've got brass balls for asking, but I'm hoping you'll be my best man. That surprised me. I looked into his face and saw tears leaking from his eyes. I'm hoping between now and then you'll forgive me, Chase. With those parting words he headed for the door, wiping his tears as he left. Tony didn't say anything. He just wandered over, staring at me. I suppose you think I should do it? I asked. Hey, it's not my decision, he said. You know, I almost wish they had gone behind my back and screwed each other. At least then I'd be in the right to carry a grudge. They didn't, though. They did the honorable thing and came to me before doing anything. Uh, huh, was Tony's confirming comment. I picked up the card. I'll think about it, okay? Tony smiled like he knew something I didn't yet. I'll tell you one thing, though. I know I've said it a million times, but I've never been more sincere than I am right now. Never ever again will I get mixed up in someone else's business. Before I could finish my thought, we both heard a woman's voice loudly asking somebody to let go. I looked over in the direction of the ruckus and saw a woman struggling to get away from a guy who had his hand tightly clapped around her wrist. She was shaking her arm, trying to break his grip, but with no success. Hey, I yelled as I launched myself in their direction, let her go. I was impressed with the pictures. I don't look half bad in a monkey suit. Yeah, you guessed it. I agreed to be Gene's best man. He sure was nervous at the reception when I got up to give my speech, though. You're probably wondering what happened that night in Plato's. Well, in spite of my sincere proclamation to never get involved again, I couldn't just stand by while some a-hole man handled a woman. Her name is Rita and it turned out the guy was her abusive, live-in boyfriend. She had, had enough, and told him he had to move out. That's when he grabbed her wrist and told her he was taking her home to beat the shit out of her. He was real brave when it came to beating up women, but Tony and I were a different matter. We both marched him out the door. As he reached the safety of his car, he turned back and vowed to get even with Rita. When we got back inside, the poor woman was shaking and crying with fear. Tony got her some water and brought it back to her while I tried to calm her down. She was sure he was headed back to her apartment to destroy everything he could get his hands on. He also had a key and could come and go as he pleased which did nothing to ensure her safety. I called the cops and tried to explain the situation to them, but they started giving me all kinds of flack, asking if his name was on the lease and did he physically harm her? Did she have bruises? Had she reported any other incidents of abuse? I finally said forget it and made another call. Jean met us at Rita's door. As soon as we got inside we could hear the jackass in the bedroom. Rita waited in the living room as Jean and I went in to see him shredding her clothes with a knife. 
As we approached, he turned the blade on us, but before I could react, Gene did some kind of Steven Seagal imitation, flipping the guy bum over end and almost breaking his wrist as he disarmed him. I remember thinking I've got to check out those classes he's taking. Rita grabbed some plastic garbage bags that we stuffed with A-Hole's clothes as Gene took the apartment key off his ring. We both sent him packing with a warning to never return. Even though it appeared to be all over, the stress was more than the beautiful redhead could take. She broke down and admitted she still feared him coming back. She didn't have the money to spend for a motel room, so of course, me being the good Samaritan that I am, I offered her my spare bedroom until things settled down. That was almost a year ago, and she's still there. Maybe I should clarify. By still there, I don't mean she's still in the guest room. After the first couple of months, we decided she should move her clothes into my bedroom. For the first time in my life, no matter what day of the week it was, I fell asleep and awakened the next morning with a woman cuddled in my arms, a woman I cared for, a woman with whom I was falling in love. Yup, the L word. I almost couldn't believe it myself, but there was no doubt that she was the one. In fact, I'm going to be a little late getting home tonight. I had to stop at the jewelry store and pick up the engagement ring I've had on layaway for the past three months. I have it all planned out. Saturday night, after dinner at our favorite restaurant, we'll take a walk along the lakefront. As the full moon shines down on us, I drop to one knee and ask for her hand. I have no doubt she'll accept. In fact, Jean has already agreed to be my best man. Oh, and I heard through the grapevine, who just happens to be a former girlfriend, that he's going to give Rita and me five shares in his company as a wedding present. This time I won't turn it down. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.